Before we do that, though, we're going to make a quick transition into an amazing panel. And this panel is going to help us shift gears from values and decisions into well-being, but how technology can support us in our human experience. So technology sometimes is in competition with our human experience and our enrichment of our peak potential, but at the same time, it's also now expanding into a way to support the enrichment of our human experience. So we've got an amazing panel joining us. I'd like to welcome to the stage our wellness innovation panel, talking about how we can engineer our... <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'd like to welcome to the stage our wellness innovation panel talking about how we can engineer our best selves and wellness as a service. This will be hosted by Kay Bartugo from, who's the founder of Bold Love Communications, and our three health tech CEOs, Lois Nahereni, I believe it is, her, from DNA Power, Sarah Goodman from iHeart, Min Fitzgerald from Neutrogene. Please come down to the stage, everyone, and Kay, I'll hand it over to you. So, my name is Kate, um, and I guess before we get started, maybe we can get each of our panelists to introduce themselves and what they do in their company. Uh, hi guys. I'm Sarah Gibbon, I'm the CEO of Vital Signs, and we're a health tech company in Vancouver. Um, we develop products that help people live longer and healthier lives. Our first product is called iHeart, and it's a fingertip device and a mobile app that determines the user's internal age by measuring aortic stiffness. So the stiffness of the biggest blood vessel in your body has been proven to be a marker of risk of heart disease, risk of developing dementia, cognitive decline, and risk of death from all causes. But it's reversible with positive lifestyle choices, such as like eating better, moving more, and decreasing stress. So we developed that, that's on the market, and now we're developing another product that helps people change their behavior and live longer and prevent disease. Hi, Lois Neherty. Uh, we help bring your genetic roadmap to you so that you can make a, a better everyday health decisions. So we do DNA testing, primarily for di diet and fitness and other preventative health areas. And we now live in this, uh, this era where we can get our own and learn what our own basic DNA roadmap is. And there are so many areas of our bodies that vary between each other and greatly affect our, our diet and our ability just to be healthy every day. So by learning what your roadmap is around things like carbs, fats, proteins, cholesterols, uh, and vitamins and nutrients, because we all have different uh, innate ability to be able to manage that, you can make uh, better everyday health decisions. Hi everyone, my name is Min Fitzgerald, a CEO and co-founder of Neutrogene. Uh, we're based in San Francisco as well as Vancouver. Uh, and what we're focused around is really helping you understand how to optimize your health, uh, aggregating different data sources you know, from DNA to uh, you know, diagnostics devices uh, like, like Sarah's. Um, and we put that together and actually make it really easy for you to action it. As we know, 95% um, actually of the supplements uh, in the market are extremely ineffective uh, and in a format that's not bioavailable. So what we do is give you clinical grade liquid supplements that are specific for your needs and actually change with you over time. So maybe just to get started, um, our earlier in our morning session, a lot of it was rooted in values and decision making. And um, in terms of the future of health, how do you foresee um, humans as having a bit more control over their health in, in terms of you know information and data gathering. Um, I think that there's a lot of information that people can gather now, but it's all coming from a lot of different sources, um, and people don't really know what to do with the information. And I think like with the wellness as a service idea, um, being able to not even just like say, oh yeah, we want you to prevent heart disease, like. We want you to, way before that, start thinking about all these different metrics and be able to change your behaviors so that you're just like optimizing your life, not just like staving off getting some kind of sickness. Um, I think we're still waiting to like, it, it's crazy because in the wearable space, who's going to have all of these different watches on, right? And like we have a tool that you don't know, wear, you, you use like once a day or however many times you want, but how can we incorporate everything together so people have the most information and can make the, the best decisions while being motivated and have like an intuitive experience. Yeah, 
Um, I think what the paradigm of health in the market that we see today is you're either sick or you're not sick. But in fact, there's a huge, um, even though you look healthy on the outside, you could actually be pre-diabetic. You could actually have many other specific underlying conditions. 90% of you in the audience is actually nutrient deficient. Uh, and you don't even know. And you could be pre-diabetic and have all these things. So imagine having all of these data sources at your fingertips and being able to have pings and notifications that tell you, hey, maybe you should change something about your lifestyle, whether it be your diet from foods that you eat um, or exercise or meditation and other sorts. So I think that's really the movement we're moving towards is a preventative health paradigm. Yeah, we are just in a health revolution. The entire world of how we manage health is just going to change drastically in the next 10 years because of data and the amount of information we're able to find out and to be able to, to use. And I think the challenge, Katie, your question is right now we have all of these devices and these pieces and these things, we, these tools we can use. In fact, I mean, already when I'm sitting with Sarah and with Man, I'm going, okay, now what do we have to bring together so that we can start to integrate all of these health ideas? Because we've got some really great individual things that are coming up, and the next 10 years will be about integrating that and really radically rethinking about our health. But the crazy thing that we're discovering through through genetics, you're discovering the nutrients and, and heart, is that it is so much coming down. And with our, our previous speaker, is that it's just around our, our health, like it's managing every day. And, and some of the stats that, that Min was talking to, again, 91% of us are nutrient deficient, and it will affect our health. And half of the world has got issues that are when we're healthy that aren't appearing that are essentially pre-cancer, pre-diabetes. And we can change that, and, and it's around choice. So it's not rare diseases, it's not um, communicable diseases, it's things we, half of the deaths in the world now are be due to personal choice. Like that's pretty scary. Yeah, and actually to go on to that point, um, when we look at genetics, um, or when we look at our whole body as a map, right, 30% of our health conditions is, you know, based on a DNA blueprint. The other 70% is actually epigenetic. So those are lifestyle factors. They require continuous monitoring tools. Um, and it doesn't need to just be one tool, it has to be many different sets. So everything from blood monitoring, uh, continuous like glucose monitoring, um, blood pressure monitoring, all of that's going to be seamless for us. And what kind of a world can we actually create when we have all of that at our fingertips, right? It'll be easier than ever before. Yeah, it's great. It's fun. So it's kind of interesting because our job, you know, my company looks at genetics and yet you get this map and this map will take, your body wants to go in a certain direction and yet the key is the epigenetics and that's just sleep and diet and stress, um, environmental factors and we control that part of it and so while your genetics is a, it's a predisposition of where your body wants to go, it's really the epigenetics and how you manage day to day that will determine where you end up. So um, that's a really interesting point and in terms of... Um, I guess there's, because it's kind of a triangle, right? You've got your genetics, you have your lifestyle choices, and then there's the environment. Um, to what degree does the environment that you're in play a role in that? And in, especially in, in the context of the social determinants of health, right? Um, and for those of you, just to clarify, if you're not familiar with the social determinants of health, um, it, this, it refers to income, education, uh, job security, you know, so on and so forth, housing, social inclusion, um, and that's just a few out of four, like, you know, 14 um, social determinants of health. Uh, so to what degree does that, you know, one's health uh, and lifestyle choice sort of can, can you control um, if your immediate environment is not as um, great, I guess, like it's from a social and economic standpoint? Well, actually, I was just uh, I was reading on telomeres, and telomeres are the caps at the end of your DNA that will, uh, the length of them will determine essentially how long you live, and you can lengthen your telomeres and shorten them, and it is a predictor of, of age. But the shocking thing is that um, the telomeres of kids who are born uh, uh, in lower socioeconomic conditions are shorter than those who are born into higher socioeconomic conditions. So to your point, it's actually exceptionally dramatic. It's, it's more dramatic than we understood about the impact. And the length of the telomeres of the parents 
uh, as, they, as they're conceived, will be generally passed on to the child as well. So if you have been doing things that are through bad health, that are shortening your telomeres, the odds are your kids will be born that way. And if you're doing things to lengthen them, the odds are your kids will be born with that as well. So the socioeconomic stuff is pretty dramatic, and they even have a, a, the link they can show education of the of the mother has a difference in terms of, of the of the telomere length, which they can measure for people. So it's just wow. I mean, it's just shocking. That is incredible. Yeah, and actually the other piece around this is I think we're really at the crux of a technological revolution. So um, you know, similar to when we go back to IoT devices, right? You, how many of you guys here have a Nest in your house? Or any, yeah, there's it's more it's more common um, but than before. I mean, uh, monitoring devices in your home. Um, everyone here has a cell phone now. These are all tools that are becoming extremely cheap. Um, and in the as technology gets cheaper, the like DNA sequencing has come down in price from hundreds of well, millions to hundreds of thousands to now how much is it? <laughs> no, no, anywhere between. Whether it's, whether, sorry, it's whether it's actually the true cost or whether it's what they're selling it for, there is a difference. But let's say, you know, 100 to $300. Yeah. So it's accessible by consumers. So you, as consumers of the audience, have the full power to be able to actually acquire this in the future. It might actually just get incorporated into medical systems so that you actually have access to it directly. So I think that's how, where the socioeconomic divide starts to shorten. It's that everyone should have... Um, ubiquitous access to all of their data and what we want to do is actually empower you to be able to have it all consolidated in one place. For us, like when we developed our first tool, we had a higher price point and we had some families reaching out saying like this is just too much even though um, each device comes with like multiple profiles to be used with friends and family. It was still too much for some families so like one of our main goals was to decrease the cost of the next product so we can actually help people all over the world and create a community-based kind of wellness system in the back end of like motivating and, and team building and challenges. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully in the future, like all of this tech that we're saying can be combined and people can have all this information will be uh, inexpensive enough for people to all like, learn together. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how realistic that is right away, right? Like, it, it will probably take um, the next, I actually think it's going to be faster if you look at some of the patents and that are coming up in terms of passing the FDA and regulatory hurdles for continuous monitoring devices. These are all going to be much more consumer friendly, continuous monitoring that's going to be possible within the next five years. Yeah, I mean, Ray Kurzweil, for instance, he mentioned, you know, the law of accelerating returns. And so hopefully, yes, you're right. Like, as we progress technology, these technologies become more accessible to a wide range of people. Um, in terms of, I guess, coming back to big data, and there's a lot of, you know, AI is coming into play with that and processing um, all this information that's being gathered, intimate data that's being gathered um, from individuals. Um, how do you foresee uh, AI's role in terms of the interplay with processing all this information about you know our genetics and lifestyle choices and our environment. We're just starting to get into the research of AI because we're going to be incorporating like an AI kind of health coach with our new product. Mm -hmm. So we want to and we want to learn with people to like what exactly which lifestyle choices affect them differently and raise these numbers and be able to use that information down the road. But like go just starting to um, research it is just super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, all of these information is just like little tidbits of people's lives can be used in such a big way. I have no idea how it will be used, yeah. but we're really excited to get involved with like gathering some of that information and learning more and more. I've got a, a friend that works with uh, apps in virtual reality, and they're able to take some of these things now and with virtual reality, this is a bit of a tangent, but mm -hmm. with Parkinson's people, help them not to move their body versus their eyes, and so there's changes there. They're able to take apps and take them into Africa and show people virtually how to be able to do surgeries uh, because there just isn't enough uh, people there. So simply by donating you know, computers and some of the equipment, there's now creating uh, access uh, all over. Um, and the genetics area, I mean, you've got a company like 23andMe, which does ancestry and certain areas of disease. Uh, and they've got now a database of over a million people and their DNA. Now this, this will just so revolutionize uh, medicine because there's, the medical fields have been very disjointed. 
very specific of things that have been studied in smaller areas, but now you've got a database of a million people, and you can go and say, let's get all the people that have this particular variation who now experience Parkinson's, and then maybe those that don't as a control group. And the stuff we're going to learn is just, and now through devices, you can say, how are you feeling this? And it, it all connects, like really, the curve is going to go just crazy, and big data is just so, it is going to play a huge role in that discovery as we search and try and figure out what um, what underlying messages and learning there is in that. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, I mean, this, I want to provide a tangible example uh, of today versus where we can go. So um, I, I lost my father-in-law um, to a liver condition uh, a year ago. And it, it, it was completely preventable, actually, because his blood work actually showed elevated liver enzymes beforehand. And the family doctor that was working with him um, didn't prompt him to say there was actually an issue. And as a patient, you trust your family doctor. Of course. Um, and so, you know, he didn't even realize there was actually an issue, but then this all came up afterwards. Now, that's today. If they caught the liver enzyme issue, maybe at that point in time, where it's actually already pretty late in stage even showing up that way, you would start changing some lifestyle factors, right? But imagine a world where you there's precursors to even you having those elevated liver enzymes. You have multiple data sources from years and years of longitudinal data, blood panels, um, your analysis, your DNA. So then what you can do is understand specifically for your age or demographic, you, ha you, you have these risk factors. And if you do these particular things over the next number of years, so these are the red warning signs you're going to get, and it's going to show up this way. And you know, these are the. It, then you know that okay, maybe you need to change your diet and eat more kale. Um, or in my case, for example, I found out that I have an MTHFR mutation. So what that means is, from a DNA perspective, I actually can't take folic acid. Wow. wow. Yeah. So I mean, how many people hear that they should take folic acid as women here, right? <laughs> Um, I can't. I can't metabolize it. I actually have a broken DNA sequence. So, like, I, I actually have to take alternative isoforms, a methylated folate, um, essentially, and then combine it with, you know, B two and other, you know, other particular vitamins, so that I can actually absorb that into my body. And if I take folic acid straight, it's actually toxic. It accumulates. It will cause issues for me. So, those are the findings that we're getting. And why shouldn't you have access to that as a consumer? Um, there's just to on that note, um, in terms of access, there's it's kind of the wild west right now in terms of the collection of big data, you know, and individual data. Um, how, like, I guess, like as consumers, it's like how can what kinds of steps can we take to ensure that as we move forward into the future, we have full control over that data and that information in the face of, of course, like you know, enterprise. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, to that point, that's why I think that right now it's such a beautiful time because we can choose to actually use tools and actually purchase things and directly influence your data. So what we're trying to do is actually assimilate all these different forms of data and actually give it back to the consumer, not holding any of that information. Um, and it's actually really up to us to fix our health. You know, I think um, Nicolette put it really well. Like it's, I mean, you have to eat, you have to do the work. Uh, and it's not just about, you know, getting something shipped to your door. Um, although, you know, the, when you're really busy, that's really great. Um, but it, ha it takes more than that. Yeah, I, you know, I'm trying to stay in the present, but I have to tell you, it is, I think that we are in this wonderful bubble right now where all really, really big questions. It, it's freaky to think yeah. about, frankly, the handmaiden's tale and, and what's happening in terms of environment and how we're toxifying our bodies and how that will affect uh, reproduction. And, and I wasn't able to have kids, and I now know, I really, truly know, had I understood how micronutrients work, because I have the same issue in uh, MTHFR, and I, I was sick for four years in my 40s where I, would, I, I actually uh, couldn't breathe properly. So imagine every time you pull in a breath, you feel like you get 80% and stop. Mm -hmm. well, that was every day for me, and so I was going to doctors and respirologists, and they sent you for asthma testing, and, you know, but I was healthy. I, I mean, I, I ate well and I exercised. Uh, but it turns out I have some serious, when I, I did my DNA testing several years ago before I ended up having the company, 
And it, it pointed out for me that I have serious issues genetically around, which many people do, around bees. That's why the Dr. Bernstein diet worked, because many people have bee deficiencies. And when I took methylated or different types of folate, it starts to fix that problem. And I, I could breathe, but it was a bit of an act. It was my DNA. And then doing some, actually hiking Kilimanjaro and taking super supplements over a period that put it together that this was really the link for me. And we are, 91% of us are nutritionally deficient. It is a problem. And so that is affecting our health. It's affecting um, chronic disease in a, in a big way. And so there's just so many things that we can be doing over the next while. We've got big ethical questions to that will face us, but in the meantime, there's just some super health things that we can do in the next walk. In a like data collection kind of environment for us, we've been pretty uh, conservative with that kind of thing with our users as a as a company that isn't medical. Yeah. We're very very careful of keeping things like everything's only for us in our own cloud and our sharing. People get really quite um, concerned of when course, yeah. when they have information, even though our metric isn't something that insurance companies would be. Um, collecting now, right. they think, well, are you going to share this later on? Mm. And with the, a new product that, that we're coming out with that has more mm. functionality and actual metrics that people are really familiar with, mm. it becomes tricky. Like, um, people always ask, oh, yeah, well, you can make so much money off this data. Like, ethically, what, what do we do there? And yeah. what, how do we help the consumer the most um, mm -hmm. while still becoming, like, being a successful company? Mm -hmm. um, we're getting into all of these decisions right now as we, like, broaden our customer base. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so lots of like figuring things out over the next little bit. But um, for us, like we just try to keep things very much confined to like our, you know, our back end. Mm -hmm. But that's interesting because what you're really talking about is uh, kind of like you know just tying it back into our earlier session, which is you're making a very conscious decision based on your values in right. terms of how you're running, you're running your company. The whole values were to help people. Yeah. Um, through education and motivation and not um, to make money off of their data. Mm -hmm. um, we have people talking to us all the time about that, but mm -hmm. I think we're sticking sticking with the, the values for now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that's a pretty interesting jumping off point in terms of um, how can uh, companies in the health, health and wellness space, like wellness as a service, um, integrate these, you know, like the moral and ethical side of things into how they choose to run their companies. Because, you know, for the most part, that, that does come down to who's in the company. So, in your experience, like, what's that like in terms of making sure that that is the case? Um, uh, we've, we've actually we've been selling for a little over two years, and we have a lot of people come and say, oh, I'm so excited about the product, I want to help sell this. And we end up there in an industry or they want to market a product in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. Like we, we like to um, communicate what we do and why we do it very clearly. So we've run into people that we just have to say, like, I'm sorry that we, we can't do business with you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't know. Ethically, I, f I feel pretty good with her. <laughs> That's good. But... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, but we're in a place where we're giving you, what we're doing is just giving you your information about how, about your day-to-day -day health and, 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 and areas about how your body functions. So, I mean, we're, we're in a safe space, but it's a trickier thing. Like, when we were doing a bit more disease testing, but we weren't actually sure that we could guide people well enough if right. they were finding some of the more serious disease markers. And so we pulled back from that for the time being, just to be sure that anything we give is, is, is fairly, not benign. Because actually the crazy thing is we're discovering how much when you eat that doesn't fit with your genes, it leads to low-grade inflammation and that um, creates the chronic disease over a very, very long period of time. And that's surfacing in the diabetes and in um, uh, other critical diseases at the moment. So it, it's, it is, your, your food is so critically important. Yeah. Um, so also, I, we aggregate the data sources and our mission is actually to empower the consumer, like empower the user so they can use that information. And I think broadly, as the space unfolds, like as wellness as a service, um, what you see are like founders and people that are have personal stories of you know death or issues or and and 
wanting to actually give that power back to the consumer um, or back to us as individuals to be able to use that information, right? Um, the second piece is the regulatory framework overall in the industry is really shifting. So um, Rock Health is one of the kind of authorities around digital health um, uh, and I I'm connected with Hallie and like a lot of the, the pieces around the FDA regulation that will have to change for digital health is already starting to change and they're actually very mindful of people's sentiment of their information. So the debate around, for example, using your genetics for insurance purposes, that is something that does come up and that's something that um, I think Trudeau was saying that it cannot be used um, in our instance, which is pretty fantastic. And um, so I think the policy makers will have to be very mindful of how our information is going to get used, but it's, it, it is being mindful. It's going in the right directions, at least so far. Yeah. Yeah, you know, with our company, it's our, our, you know, one of our tag guides is empower your health and take power over your health. And so that's the real goal of what we're trying to do. But I think, you know, I really loved how we started out today where we were talking about, uh, you know, purpose and values. And I think what we, there's also a piece around how do we ensure that we're creating purpose and values in all of our business and that we do bring, um, you know, a conscious uh, entrepreneurs together to bring it together in a really um, aligned, uh, helpful way for humanity. and and. That's where I do think we, you know, it will be people like us in the room, all of you who are coming together and thoughtfully saying, how do we integrate what we're doing? All become very socially conscious about the work that we're doing, so that we do take it in a in an ethical direction that will support the earth as opposed to potentially become too, you know, green negative oriented. I mean, uh, you touched on a, just to kind of backtrack a little bit. You touched a little bit on on something that's. I also coming up a lot in the space, which is the genetic therapy and the you know editing genes and all that stuff. Um, or I mean, when we talk about health and wellness, it's it's about longevity. It's about you know our the, the human obsession with longevity. And are we hurtling towards immortality? Like at some point, you know, when you're talking about AI and big data and all these like you know your your decisions. Um, which are, as we heard earlier today, emotionally based. And now technology can play, so, play a role in terms of, you know, making that a bit more rational. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> a bit more rational. Um, are, are we eventually going to end up there? And what, you know, what do you think of that, like that idea? I have to say I worry about the opposite direction more. Huh. I think that there will be aspects and instances of where we are able to engineer and create some level of possibly immortality, but the level of um, environmental uh, degradation yes. that we're doing to the earth and the level, the fact that over 50% uh, of us, you know, one in two will get cancer, that that number is increasing, mm -hmm. and that we've created a lifestyle that will be embedded in our genetic code and passed on for periods of time um, will we're at far greater risk in the opposite direction uh, currently, and we need to switch that very quickly. Now, will there be aspects? Perhaps, but we don't want immortality to become the, uh, you know, the opportunity for the few rich. Mm -hmm. And even then, you know, it is it is around discipline in, in managing your health in order to make that happen. So even if you end up with perfect code, you can really mess it up just by your life choices. Mm -hmm. So it, there is a there is a dual responsibility, and we have to reeducate. Our, ourselves and our population and the world around how um, our lifestyle does is it plays a big important role for our long-term success as a species. For for us, like I, I'm not in the DNA business, but I do like we chose the metric internal age or to change this aortic stiffness measurement to internal age because it has such an emotional impact immediately on people, yeah. and everybody wants to be younger than they actually are. No one's, in my experience, said, I, will, I want to live forever, but I would, they always want to live a longer, better life, right. healthier life. Yeah. And people are very motivated when they use our product, when they get an older score, to start those lifestyle choices, right. or, or changing their lifestyle choices pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the immortality, I don't know, uh, with the DNA side, and things like CRISPR, like, who yeah. knows what's going to happen, but that does seem like it would be something for someone in a very, like, Yes. Wealthy position. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be offered to people on the street, right? Like, but we can offer something that will give you the tools mm -hmm. to live a longer and more like healthy life. And I mean, there's seven billion people on the planet today, 
right? Um, we started this because we found that three billion of those people are deficient. Um, if we can't find, if we can't figure out how to fix what's so fundamentally broken right now, um, how are we going to strive fully towards mortality if we're actually moving forward as a species? Um, I think. When people think about immortality, they think about it in the context of living a healthy, long life. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we can lengthen the number of those years of that life. And I think we're moving towards, you know, that that in some degree. But it's it's first going to come with resolving an underlying issue around how do you even understand how you get chronic disease. Right. Yeah, and then I think the the next steps are there. Right. Sorry, could we just go? Okay, that's perfect. Um, I guess like last, you know, last words in terms of, um, you know, empowering or motivating oneself in terms of making the current, like, you know, healthy lifestyle choices and towards wellness and optimal health. Um, what would be your number one, I guess, like first, like a good first step for somebody who's trying to shift into um, a healthier uh, lifestyle? I think, and I, I used to be a nutritionist and personal trainer, and I worked with a lot of people who were going from being sedentary to wanting to be active and change their lives. And uh, really, I think it's just finding something that you really like to do and making it not seem like work. Living in Whistler, it's pretty easy to do that. Um, but uh, if you're forcing yourself to go to the gym or you do get these recommendations from an app, like, oh, you should be running every day, and you hate it, then you're not going to do it. So if you find something that makes you feel good while you're doing it and after, that's something that'll stick. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I studied behavioral economics uh, was because, like, how do you how do you actually get yourself to change behavior? Um, it's it's really tricky, and um, the best the best way to get started is to start with a very very small easy step, um, and ideally with a habit that already exists as a plan, like seamlessly into another thing. So when we were thinking about uh, what we wanted to do, for example, uh, I was thinking from the mindset of, oh, I love data personally, right? But not everyone loves data, and not everyone acts on data insights. So what we want to do is take it a step further and make that data actually provide something and just actually give it, just send it to you. So you have one less friction point. So that's that's where the, the notion is going. It's like, how do you make things easier to implement? Yeah, I would agree with that. What we were finding is we get these you know, big reports on your DNA, but we really need to go back to people and just say these are the three things you need to remember. Just three things. You need to take vitamin Bs, you need to decrease your, your lactose from your dairy, uh, and you know, maybe that you need to add a little bit more walking or exercise because there's other dimensions as well. And so I think it is really just how do you get to three little things a day that you shift or change, or maybe it's just you know, add a, you know, a, a, a juice or a smoothie or something. And uh, I mean, I think that that's the key. Um, and I, I would say that's one dimension. The other part is just really be thinking each day about what is your, you know, what is your purpose? Uh, what what are your values? What makes you happy? That you know, a few minutes every morning, every evening, just to take, sit, be still. And when we're still, the answers come, and we're we're more knowing. I also think gamification is quite powerful as well. Having like a team or something, even even if it's just like a Fitbit. You want to get to a certain point. Right. Again, like with the data, that helps a lot of people as well. So. Or just get really scared by using my device. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got it here. <laughs> there we have it. Just we a little, so we have we used Sarah's device in our family, and it was really interesting. Where you know, I came out just a little bit under my age. Um, uh, my kids came out much older. I have adopted children, and they, they really, we, we, there's a whole piece about how I got, you know, interest in DNA just because of my adopted identical twins. Um, but we do my, did my dad, and he is, uh, just turned 78 yesterday, and he comes out at like 43, and this guy's like climbing over my roof, helping at the house. So I wished him a happy 43rd birthday yesterday. That's awesome. Well, the kids, the reason, the reason behind it is really the sitting. Yeah. Phones. Video games, computer time, and not being outside constantly. We see people that grew up uh, that are like around 56 years old now, they grew up really active and they still like have pretty low scores because that's stuck with them. Yeah, so. Eat healthy, get exercise, and uh, spend time for yourself too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't feel bad if you don't always do all those things. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I just, and just to wrap that out, I think that it's also really important to recognize that our um, 
you know, sustainable choices, environmental choices um, are pretty critical too. And so when we talk about saving the planet, it's not actually saving the planet, it's saving ourselves as a human species. Because the planet will exist with or without us. And our health depends on that too. So and don't pray for Mother Earth, pray for us, because she'll kick us off if we don't behave. Yeah. Okay, that's about it. Thank you so much.